Today we're taking a look at the first few issues of Marvel's The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. This series ran from 1983 to 1986 and is the most significant ongoing series adult Indiana Jones got in any media. With the series launching between the release of Raiders of the Lost Ark and Temple of Doom, it was a great way for kids in this time to experience more adventures with their favorite hero. The series has a unique Saturday morning cartoon type of feel to it, which is less research-based compared to later Dark Horse works. The first cover here by Terry Austin takes inspiration from Richard Amzell's Raiders poster, with Indy facing the viewer with his whip in full motion. And we get our first whip action in the very first image of the comic. In a fun play on how Indy's adventures begin with a visit to his classroom by Marcus, here, Indy whips a cigarette out of his student's mouth because he needs practice. Indy is met by Charlie Dunn, a former student, the best he ever had in fact. Charlie and his sister Edith have discovered the location of the icons of Ecomenon, statues that, according to legend, can become living Avengers. Dunn lasts just one page as he is killed by an assassin outside the window. Indy goes through his bag and finds a hotel address in Liberia with the sister's name, and he heads off to Africa. The city of Krakambo, or Krakamibo? A coastal town that Indy and Marion had visited years ago. Jones is met by Charlie's sister Edith Dunn, another former student, and Indy is impressed that she has fended for herself in Krakambo. But they find her hotel room has been ransacked, and a pair of assassins suddenly attack. The punches fly. But Edith is taken. And Indy has to use his whip to get after them. I love this panel of Indy's descent, cleverly illustrating the sense of movement and action. Indy pursues the kidnapper in a chase reminiscent of the basket game from Raiders. But he's led into a trap, and ends up in a rat infested space below ground. Indy unlocks the door with his key, and is met by the charming and sinister Solomon Black, who sits on a throne in a room full of gold. Black has a great intimidating presence, and strikes me as a kingpin type character. His agents have been monitoring Edith, and were supposed to bring Indy here through less aggressive means. With a knife to Edith's throat, Indy agrees to let Black join the expedition and lay claim to the golden statues. Soon our characters are aboard a Czechoslovakian ship headed for the Uncharted Island, maintaining radio silence to avoid the attention of German submarines. The small island, shrouded in fog, is a death trap for approaching ships, so Indy, Edith, and two others head to the island in a small dinghy. The booby-trapped beach takes one of Black's men with a barrage of arrows, and Indy and Edith must proceed with caution. After making their way through a dead jungle and hills of basalt, they lay their eyes on a Kamenon, where a huge tower looms over an empty town. Inside the tower they find the icons, horrifying and ultra-realistic statues of gold. But they aren't statues. They're golden casted corpses. Suddenly the pair are attacked by the natives and are soon hanging above a pit of molten gold. And as they are slowly lowered, our first issue ends, and our second begins with this dynamic cover. A blast is heard from outside, where Solomon Black and his men are staging a brutal assault on a Kamenon. As the natives rush out, Indy and Edith swing themselves away from the pit and kick the lever to release the chain. But Black, no longer with a need to keep them alive, orders his men to put them down. But the natives come back in force, and they all have to team up again to stay alive. The natives are no match for their automatic weapons, and after a quick massacre, Indy and Edith find themselves right back where they started. 
Indy lies to Black to keep them alive, saying that the inscriptions below the statues give directions to a second cache of gold statues. Locked in their room aboard the ship, Edith stuns Indy by changing into an alluring gown and distracting the guard. Indy begins to send a message, but the radio is shot, and the men take him and Edith captive again. Just as they are being forced to walk the plank, a German U-boat appears and fires its torpedo, decimating the ship as Indy and Edith leap into the water. A single crate with one of the icons rises to the surface and Indy convinces the Germans to teleport it and them to New York. There, Edith charters a plane home where the museum is dedicating a wing to her and her icon. She seems to show no remorse for her brother's death and wants the glory for herself. Aboard the flight, Indy exposes Edith's secret. She orchestrated her brother's murder. She shot the radio in the ship while actually aiming for Jones. Her associate, Jerry, steps out and is about to kill Indy, but Indy cleverly recites a curse he learned from the inscriptions, one that is said to bring vengeance to the wicked. The statue comes to life, a gold-encrusted avenger, while Jerry futilely fires away at the supernatural menace, Indy grabs a parachute and takes his leave, leaving Edith and Jerry to a dreadful fate. So that concludes the icons of Akamenin. The next issue does pick up immediately after the events of issue 2 here, but it's otherwise a completely unrelated story. You can tell right away that the quality of this series is nowhere near that of the later Dark Horse miniseries. And not just due to the changes in coloring and printing techniques. This monthly series has an assembly line feel to it, where the editor just needs to make sure they publish something each month. There is little to no research here. Stories and MacGuffins come entirely from the imagination of the writer. Having said that, I do thoroughly enjoy the first issues here. They do a great job recapturing the spirit of Raiders of the Lost Ark, with the chase through for Cambo, supernatural elements, and the sense of lingering mystery. The icons of a Kaminon plot is pretty great, and there are some very interesting characters throughout these issues. John Byrne, who spearheaded the icons of a Kaminon, was left frustrated by demands from Lucasfilm and left the series after issue two. I think the first two issues here are at least worthy of a recommendation, though I would definitely go with a Dark Horse series over this if you had a choice. Anyways, be sure to let me know your experiences with these comics down below, and hit like and subscribe so you never miss any content like this. I would definitely recommend checking out my Spear of Destiny motion comic through the link here. Thank you so much as always, and I wish you all fortune and glory. Bye bye now.